Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Yes. Well, that was a three. Okay, we're going to try this one more time. Maybe my hearing device is messed up this morning. Are you guys happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, we have the handbell choir. He's going to put us uh, on alert this morning from a praise team perspective. I heard them this morning. They sounded good. So, Miss Pat, all yours, take it away.
Phen phenomenal job. Thank you, Miss Pat and the Handbell Choir. Amazing work. I am not that coordinator. I won't be honest with you. They do, they do great, great job. All right, before we have announcements, we have another announcement. Now, I gave this guy only 20 minutes, so if he goes over, we're calling him back. Brother Andy. All right. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Great. Hey, I just wanted to give you all a report on our spaghetti fundraiser last week, uh, last Sunday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there was so much love. And I just want to read a verse. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ laid down his love. He laid down his life, and there's no love greater than that. Last Sunday, y'all loved on our students. Unbelievably. It was incredible, the amount of love that was expressed. And I just want to say thank you, a heartfelt thank you for your generous giving. So that when we load up the vans on July 8th, and 30 students, many students, some adults, and we go to Highlands Lake Camp, that when we get out of the vans and, and we, we begin camp, that the Holy Spirit, that the Word of God will be poured in to these young people. And that when we leave on Friday, five days later, we can share what Matthew 28 says, go, therefore, and make disciples. You will never know what your generous giving will do in someone's life. And I just want to say thank you. On behalf of the student ministry, thank you for your generosity. Thank you so much. God bless. was a great blessing. Um, may I say how much was raised? Nope, we don't know. Money's still coming in, so that was great. It was great spaghetti as well. Um, welcome to church. Praises for the rain? Yes, amen. We got almost an inch at home, although I heard there were some that kind of passed by, but uh, we're so thankful because we desperately need it. If you're our guest today, first, thanks for being here. We appreciate that you chose to spend this morning with us worshiping our God, and we ask that you would fill out a Connect card. It's the long, skinny card that's in the pew back in front of you. If you wouldn't mind filling that out and then leaving it um, with the offering boxes in the back, that gives us a chance to reach out to you and, and welcome you, and thank you for visiting. I hope you grabbed a bulletin. You'll see that there was lots of information in there, but I, I'm going to let you read all of that. I did want to point out, though, this evening is a business meeting. So at 5 p.m. This, this evening is our quarterly business meeting. If you're a member of the church, your vote's needed on all of the different things that we talk about and that we have to discuss or that are brought forward, different reports, it's important that you're here. If you're considering our church, we'd love to invite you to come to that just so you can kind of see how we work. Uh, but it's very important, so please be sure to come to that 5 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. You'll also see that next Sunday there's a couple of special events. Be sure um, that you attend those as well as National Day of Prayers coming up. Uh, Mr. Richard is going to have a report next weekend, correct? So the uh, free clothes giveaway was yesterday, and it was phenomenal. Uh, thank you for donating. He'll give a report on that next Sunday so you'll know all of the details. Boys and girls, come on down for children's message. You're going to meet Pastor Bill right here up front. Everyone else, let's stand and greet each other and welcome them this morning.
All right, if you are a child, you should be up here, and if you're not, let's get back to our seats. Pastor Bill's going to have another, hopefully not a messy children's sermon this morning. No, we're hoping not. Okay, welcome guys, gals. I want to tell you a secret, something I'm not trying to scare you. But there are people in this room who can read your minds. And you know them. You call them a special name. Mama. Any of you have mamas here? I want you to point at your mom. Where's your mom? My mom is in heaven. Point at your mom. Where's your, your mom's up there? Where's your mom? Point. These people are mind readers. I just want you to know that. I see her up there. These people are mind readers. You know how I know? Because no. for several years of your life, you couldn't talk at all. And yet they knew, and your dads too, by the way. We're not, the dads are, they're just not as good as moms. But they knew exactly what you needed. They knew what was going on in your life. All you could do was cry or smile, and they knew. How did they know that? Because, yeah, you better watch out when you get older. They don't give up on that mind-reading stuff. There's someone else in this room, though, listen, more importantly, someone else that can read minds better than mamas. You know who it is? Jesus. You're exactly right. Jesus can read minds. You know how I know that? Because the Bible says... That, well, we've been learning how to pray, right? On Sunday mornings, we've been talking about the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus taught us how to pray, and our Father who art in heaven, right? We're going to be praying that here in just a minute, in fact. Our Father who art in heaven, he teaches us how to pray, but here's what I know. When you really come to God with your heart, when you really come to God seeking Jesus, you can't listen. You can't pray wrong. Did you know that? It's impossible. If you're coming seeking God with your whole heart, it's impossible to pray in a wrong way, because here's what the Bible says. When we trust Jesus as Savior, the Savior sends his Spirit to live inside of us. And this is what it says about about the Holy Spirit. It says he intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. So around all of your prayers, around all the stuff that you're not really sure how to pray, and believe me, you're going to be there someday, here's what I know. God prays for us. The Spirit of God living in us prays to Jesus in such a way He doesn't just read our minds. He reads what we need. He knows exactly what you need no matter what. Isn't that cool? He knows what you need before you ever say it, before you even know what you need. He knows it. So we're safe. We're really safe. Safer, As safe as you were with your mom, even more safer with Jesus. So let's pray to him right now. Pray it in a way that we know how, but then trust in him to take care of us beyond that. So let's pray together. God, we thank you that you've given us your spirit. Lord, we thank you that that spirit intercedes from the deepest parts of who we are, intercedes for us here, every child here, every adult here, including this pastor, Lord. What we can ask for, what we can comprehend is beyond what we really need. So we're trusting you today. We trust you every day. You know what we need and, and you know how to pray through us. And so, Lord, you know how to worship through us. You know how to live through us. So, Lord, we're just asking that you do that right now. Thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for this great knowledge. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want this much energy. How about that, right? It's been, you guys are awesome. I love it. Okay, so we have a question for you this morning. Are you washed in the blood? Let's stand. Let's answer that question this morning.
spotless are they white as snow. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. You may be seated this morning. We're going to teach you a new song. We hadn't done that in a few weeks. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. You will be awake after this song. So be warned. It's a little upbeat. Uh, but the message is strong. It says, all praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome. The King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. Amen? Okay, that's the verse. <laughs> if you don't know the rest of it, it's okay, but you'll be on the hook for the verse. But we're going to teach you this morning. I believe it's a uh, Phil Wickham song, if you don't know this one. All right, here we go. Oh, 
praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I believe, I believe. I believe, I believe. Amen. I hope you believe this morning. Woo. All right, Brother TJ's got to get me some breath. <laughs> brother TJ's going to lead us in prayer. Amen, brother. Thank you. If y'all please bow your heads, please recite the uh, Lord's Prayer with me this morning. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother TJ. We're going to continue this, our worship this morning with evermore. Amen.
worthy and honor of our praise this morning. Thank you, Father. Sing out to the Father this morning.
Check, check, check. Got to be on to work, right? It's one of those things. Good morning and welcome. I ask if you have a Bible with you, turn with me to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis 5 0. We are pursuing, well, we're in the middle of a series which is in the middle of another series which is following up to another series. Our series is the whole Bible, honestly, till the day we die. Uh oh, major catastrophe up here. Hang on. What is happening? Power, we need power. Y'all talk among yourselves for just a few minutes. No idea why I've lost power here. Oh, it's unplugged. <laughs> that tends to be that tends to be a, like a series of things going on here. Genesis chapter fifty. This thing will fire up in a minute. It's got a it's got a it's got to see my face. It's got one of those facial recognition things. There we go. Let me restart it. Please come back on. Is it on up there? We'll, we'll find out. Genesis 50, actually Genesis, the previous four, four chapters, deals with the subject of what we're concerning ourselves with for the past several weeks together, which has to do with forgiveness, has to do with forgiving people who hurt us. And the story that we find near the end of Genesis is maybe the most famous story of people dealing with forgiveness of pain. The greatest pain that's going to happen to you in this life will happen to you from, most likely, from people who should have loved you the most. The people who should have loved you the most have had the greatest capacity to hurt you. It's just the facts, just the way it is. Somebody you didn't know who cut you off in traffic, you got mad at them, you got over it. Someone who did know you, who did love you or supposed to love you, who you loved and gave your heart to in many different ways that did you wrong, has the capacity of really doing massive damage in your life for whatever reason. And the story that we find in Genesis chapter 50 is a story, well, the end of a story of that very thing. It's the story of Joseph. Remember what happened to Joseph in the Old Testament? He got sold into slavery by who? His brothers, 10 of his 11 brothers sold him. They were jealous of him. His dad, his whole family was a real big piece of work. They should have been on Jerry Springer. I mean, they were just something else. And his dad was the instigator of all of it. He held favorites. Joseph was his favorite. He made him a coat of many colors. You know the story, don't you? I'm going to let you read it tonight when we're done. You need to read it. It's one of the best stories, in my opinion, one of the best stories in the entire Bible because uh, it is the story of forgiveness. It is the story of redemption. It is the story of God working around great pain and great difficulty and great sin. And I'm telling you, if God cannot work around sin and difficulty and pain, then he cannot work in our world. He cannot work in your life because that's our issue, isn't it? I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner sold to sin. If God cannot work with sinners, then, well, we're all, first of all, we're all going to hell together. And I'll lead you there because we have no hope outside of a Savior who can't work with sinners. So, but in fact, we do have that very Savior. So the story of Joseph is that very story. He's sold into slavery. Uh, he gets brought up on false charges, effectively, thrown into jail for a number of years. He goes in at 15, he comes out at 30. He's got a lot of reasons to be mad. For, well, let's just say that. Does he have a reason to be mad at his brothers? Absolutely. Positively has a reason to be mad at his brothers. Does he have a reason, does he have a right to stay mad at his brothers? According to the Bible, no, he doesn't. I don't care what someone does to you, you don't have a right to stay angry with them. You don't have a right to hold a grudge against them. And let me just say this, if you think you have a right, then you will not be able to escape the consequences of what that will do to you. Because the Bible doesn't say what it says without cause. You hold bitterness, you hold on to unforgiveness, it will damage you. It will hurt you. God has gone on record to say, forgive me, or, or not forgive me, just straight up, to say that he will make sure that it does. God wouldn't do that. Read your Bibles, please. 
He definitely does do those things because he puts a premium on forgiveness. He puts a premium on our relationships with each other. If we cannot love each other and forgive each other, then how is it possible for us to love the God who we cannot see? That's the point made in John and other places. So the story of Joseph, we're going to pick it up here in verse 17 of chapter 50, is a story of him forgiving supernaturally. Again, forgiveness is supernatural. It requires you dependence upon God, trusting in God, filled with this Holy Spirit. You cannot do it any other way. And in case you haven't been hurt that bad, you will. You'll be hurt so bad that it's impossible, humanly speaking, to forgive. The days, if it hasn't happened to you yet, it's coming. I'm sorry, we live in a bad world. It happened to Joseph, happened to him. The end of the story here in chapter 50 is now, they've been 30 years, he's become their rescuer. He's become the savior of the whole nation, all of his brothers. He's become the second most powerful man in the world. He, he provides a way for them to come down to Egypt to escape a massive drought. He, he becomes the rescuer of all his people. He's been protecting them, caring for them now for 30 years in Egypt. His dad, Jacob, finally passes away. His brothers, all of them with one exception, are all older than him. They're thinking now he's the most powerful guy in the world. We did him really wrong. What should we expect? Vengeance. He certainly was in a position where he could pull it off. And so, if you will, they kind of trump something up here, but watch what they say, verse 17 and following. Let's do verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph should bear a grudge. <laughs> Everybody would expect him to. Against us. And pay us back in full for all the wrongs that we did to him. And they did. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died, saying thus, and there's no, no reason for us to think he actually said this. Because the brothers were kind of, like I said, this, this family was, was a piece of work. So I, I don't, I don't you, may, you may disagree with me and you're fine to be wrong all you want to. <laughs> but I don't, think, I don't think the dad ever said this. They're just trying, to, they're trying their best to make it degrees the path for them, basically. So thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now, please forgive the transgressions of your servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept. When he spoke to them, this has been 45 years since they did it. Remember what I told you about forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Bearing the consequences of someone else's sin. Living with the consequences of someone. That's what forgiveness is. And nothing less than that. Don't, don't think that's true. Look at Jesus. He's caught the consequences of your sin on his body in heaven right now. The nail pierces in his hands and his feet, the, 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 the scar in his side, the scar on his brow from the thorn of crowns. They're because of you. And they will always be there. It is the biblical definition of forgiveness, bearing the consequences of living with the consequences of someone else's sin. He's done that. Joseph has been living with these consequences for 45 years, and he, he's dealing with it. He weeps here at, at the end of verse uh, 17. Then his, I'm sorry, at the verse of... Uh, where did I say? They, yeah, that's, that's the end of verse 17. Verse 18 is where we are. And his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. They know he's got them. If he wants them, he can nail them. This is his shot. This was a movie, right? This is where he would get him right here. This is where the hero comes through and seeks out vengeance and not Joseph. Joseph said to his brothers, do not be afraid, for I am I in God's place. Wow, that is a massive statement. Because here's what unforgiveness says. I have a right to vengeance. And let me just say this to you. Where we go wrong with anger and unforgiveness, we go wrong, one, first of all, if we, when we let it run. Secondly, when we start assigning a, a motive, because you don't know what their motives were. You never will. Only God knows that. And then, and then a, third, a third thing, when we start acting like God, because God says, vengeance is mine. Part of, let me say this to you, man, part of your unforgiveness is that you want vengeance. It's not yours. You don't want God's job. And you don't want what will happen to you when you try to take over God's job. Don't do it. Joseph is a smart man. 
Joseph doesn't do it. Am I in the place of God? Verse 20, as for you, you meant evil against me. Notice he doesn't cut him any slack because there was no slack to cut because what they did was bad. But God meant it for good. Again, a massive statement. This is a mature man of God. He understands. God's bigger than all the evil in the world that can happen to you. I don't know what they did to you, sir, ma'am. I don't know what they said. I don't know how they treated you, but I'm telling you, God is bigger than that. Our God, whom we just finished, not finished, in the process of worshiping, is bigger than whatever they did to you. He's bigger, in fact, he's so big that he can take what they did to you and make good out of it. It was all evil as far as they were concerned. You meant it for evil. Notice, it wasn't just something that they did not paying attention. They planned it. It was their brother. They talked about it. They discussed it. They threw him in a hole in the ground. They did all that. I'm going to take this jacket off because I think that's the problem. Y'all forgive me if the, if the back isn't ironed, okay? We'll just... I got no idea. I ironed it yesterday, so hey. They, they did all this. He doesn't cut him any slack. There's no slack to cut. So therefore, he says... I keep reading. As for you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Such a statement. In order to bring about this present result, in other words, that our lives were spared, that our families were spared, to preserve many lives. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Wow, what a statement of forgiveness. He's in a position of complete power and authority. He, unlike you, possibly can work in complete vengeance if he wants to. He doesn't do it. In fact, he, he still hurts from the pain of it. He still cries because that's what, again, that's what is forgiveness, is bearing the consequences of someone else's sin. Consequences of their sin, he was separated from his family for a solid 15 years in, in horrible circumstances. So he, 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 he understands that. He follows some, some of the steps we've been talking about together. Again, these steps are, even though they come out of, Dr. Gary Smalley's book, they're actually coming from the book, the, the book. Otherwise, I wouldn't be wasting your time with somebody's opinion. If it doesn't agree with the scriptures, then I'm not about it. Notice several things that he does here. He forgave them before God. You got to do that. He defines the offense. You got to do that. He calls it what it is. He grieves the loss, doesn't he? Still crying. He understood his offenders, and he does one more step, and that's the step we're going to concentrate on this morning, and this is it. An excellent example of the very next step of dissolving anger is looking for the good that has come from the bad. He does that. He sees. You did this to me. You meant evil. It wasn't the coat, but I'm going to leave it off. <laughs> it wasn't the coat. You would meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God is capable of taking this nasty stuff that you fully intended to kill me, hurt me, whatever with, and turn it into something amazing because he is my God and I have trusted him. And so what an incredible thing. The scriptures speak the same thing about the trials, tribulations, hurts, and pains that we go through. I'm going to put several things on, this, on the board for you. Romans chapter 5 to begin with. Romans 5, 3, and 4. Am I connected up there? Hello. Darryl, what do you know? We also glory in our sufferings. How are you doing with that? Excited about the hard stuff you're going through. Are you? Well, that's what it says. We glory in our sufferings because we know, do you know, that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want hope? I mean, what is life without hope? The horrible world, it can be terrible, but with hope, man, we can do it, right? God's moving you there. He, he can take even the bad stuff in your life. So, oh, we glory in our sufferings because why? Because sufferings are a good thing? No! God is better. God is gooder <laughs> than the sufferings. Better. Do you really trust him? Not just mumbo-jumbo talking about fun stuff and stuff that we hope. No, this is rubber meets the road of a Christian life, of a Christian walk that comes up against an evil world and an evil things dealt against us, and God is bigger. And if he's not, why are we wasting our time? 
He indeed is. Here's another one. We've seen this one. James chapter 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. How are you doing? This is great. I'm having such a terrible time. <laughs> I'm so excited about all that God is doing in my life because it's awful. Sounds messed up, doesn't it? It's not messed up. It's not crazy. It is absolute truth because God is bigger, not because you are, because the God you trust is bigger. He's bigger and better than whatever, whatever it is you're going through. Face whenever trials of many kinds, no matter what they did, because you know, do you? There it is. It assumes you know. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. The same thing Paul said in Romans. Let perseverance finish its work. How are you doing with that? It's, man, it's making me sick. Man, it's hurting real bad. Man, it's just taking me through the ringer. It never seems to let up. Yeah, I know. It, it's working. Trust God. Let your perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Isn't that what you want? Or you just want to stay a big old baby all the time? God won't let you do that. The fact is, the things that happen in this life can turn us into big old babies, can't they? God's bigger than that. God is able to take those things and shape them. Because here's the ultimate verse, the ultimate conclusion of all of it, right? Romans 8, 28, still in your Bible. I don't care what you're going through, it's still in your Bible. And we know, here it is, that same thing. They keep saying that. The Holy Spirit keeps saying that. Don't you know this? Know this stuff. Meditate on this stuff. Let it be running through your head, especially if you're going through a hard time. We know that God works for the good of those who love him. Is that true about you? Who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. It's in your Bible. It's not just true for the next life. It's true for this one. One of the key differences between taking an offense and getting bitter as opposed to getting better is focusing on this and saying God's making something good out of this. God is working, looking for these things finding these things, the good that's coming out of the bad. Part of Joseph's forgiveness of his brothers was, was saying, yeah, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You can say that over whatever you're going through in life right now. God meant it for good, and what God means to do, he's going to do it. He, I don't care what the devil dished out, he's going to do it. No need to look for the bad, is there? In, that's the definition of unforgiveness. Meditating on the bad stuff. Ah, you do that naturally. Every day you wake up with that same old hurt, that same old pain. I don't like her. You don't, I wish she'd fall over dead, whatever it is you say. I thought the same kind of stuff. A bunch of liars, y'all pretending like you don't stuff think like that. <laughs> so Gary Smalley calls it pearl counting. The trials in our lives, the things we go through, the hurts and pains we experience are like sand. It's like a sandstorm. God will take this little bit of sand like he does in an oyster and turn it into a pearl. Give him time. Count the pearls. Find the pearls. Look for the pearls. Again, what are we trying to get to? We're trying to get to a place where we're not just theologically I've forgiven, but emotionally in every other way I've forgiven. I've dissolved this anger I no longer rest on it or think about it anymore. I'm to the place where I've moved on from this tragedy, whatever it was, in my life. We're trying to get ourselves there. This is part and parcel of that, this counting the pearls. Quite often, it isn't just the offense that causes us problems. It's the reaction to that offense. Not just what they did, but it's what we did in response, the way we handled it, whether it's assigned blame or assigned motive or not forgive or whatever it is, that all these things come together. Mark Twain uh, put it this way. It's not just the things that happen to us. It's the, our handling of those things that can make such a huge difference. This is what he says. I'm an old man and have known a great many troubles, but most of them never happen. A lot of the stuff that tears us up is not what actually happened to us, but how we handled that experience, how we dealt with that, how we reacted to it. In some cases, it's the vast majority of what's really wrong in the situation. Not what they did, but what we've done ever since. 
Remember, unforgiveness is like leaving your anchor in the bottom and trying to sail on and blaming a person for how your boat sails. Pull in the anchor, pull in the anchor, that's forgiveness. Pastor was invited to speak at a church in another town. He had to take a flight to that town, and he was going to stay with a particular member in the church, and uh, they gave him the address, and when he arrived in the airport, he was, took, a, took a cab to their house, and they sent him a text saying, we may not be there, but we've left the door unlocked. Just make yourself at home. And so they let him off at the address. He goes to the front door. Sure enough, they aren't there. He tries to open the door. The front door's locked. So he steps back and checks the address again. Sure enough, it's the right place. So they must be talking about the back porch. And so there's a privacy fence around the back. So he goes around the back, pulling his you know, luggage with him, opens the privacy gate, rounds the corner, headed to the back door. Out of the corner of his eye, he sees movement. Turns and focuses, and a very large dog is rapidly closing the distance between itself and him. I mean coming at it. He goes into full flight or fight, you know, mode. He drops all of his stuff, way outgunned. This dog is massive. The dog just, I mean, on him, just charging. The dog comes up to him and just slides to a stop and starts panting and wagging his tail. <laughs> Nothing happened, right? Nothing actually happened. He says, boy, I couldn't convince my body of that. He said, I had to sit down, you know. I was dizzy. I mean, my fingers were tingling. My toes were tingling. He said, about a third of my blood was adrenaline. He said, I was in bad. He said, I thought I was going to have a stroke. He said, it was just awful. But he says, nothing happened. Often, that's what happens to us. It's sometimes not the offense, but our perception of the offense and how we handled it. Because we began to assign motive and because we began to hold back and look for vengeance and taking the place of God. And so, yeah, there was a sin committed against us, but now, as a result, we've gone off and done all these other sins. We have to get to the place where we're dealing with unforgiveness. So let me give you some important reminders, a couple of things. Number one, this is critical, very important, because believe me, the devil knows how this works, and so you need to know. Avoid, as much as possible, extreme thoughts. Hear me, if you can't control your thoughts, you can't control your life. God has given you the power through his Holy Spirit to control what runs in and out of your ears. You cannot, I mean, in and out of your brain. And if you can't, you've got to control that stuff. C control your thoughts. Extreme thoughts like, this is absolutely the worst thing. No, it's not. It's not. That's a lie. It may be awful. It may be the worst thing you've ever seen but it is definitely not the worst thing. This has never happened to anyone else ever. That is also not true. It is not. Control your thoughts. Here's the scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought, make it obedient to Christ. You live in a world where the devil knows how to control you. And he does it through your thoughts. you got to be careful. You cannot keep the birds, as they say, from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. The devil is throwing stuff at you constantly because he can control you if he can make you think the way he wants you to think. As a man thinks, so is he. As a woman thinks, so is she. You can't control your thoughts. You can't control the way that you are. I'm having, having issues here have to be able to control our thoughts. It's not the worst thing. How do we know? Because hell is the worst thing. Hell is what you deserve. The absolute worst thing is God giving you what you deserve and you're currently not there. So whatever is going through, I don't know what it is, but it is not the worst thing. It is not. And it is not the thing that has only happened to you because, again, we have the scriptures that teach us these things. Ecclesiastes 1. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. The wickedness that has been done to you that you've experienced is not the first rodeo. Stuff happens. It will continue to happen because this is an evil world with a devil in charge. 
and a lot of sinners at his beck and call. It just is what it is. So, so we have to be careful with our thoughts, be very careful with them, but it's not just a matter of I have to be careful what I allow in. I also have to be, it's not just that, we have to replace these things. So number one, be careful of extreme thoughts. Number two, focus on Jesus. Sounds like a Sunday school answer, doesn't it? Because it's the answer, guys. It's the answer. Focus on Jesus. Change your thoughts from all that I'm losing to all I'm going to eventually gain in Christ. Because as evil as they were to you, they're not in charge. Jesus is. Jesus is. We trust him. We trust him. We trust him. No matter how big the, the, the event was, how horrible it was, how difficult it was, how painful it was, Jesus is bigger. We trust him. We trust what he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment. Again, this is what the Bible says about whatever you're going through. And again, it's not to offend you. But I promise you, compared to what you deserve, what you're currently going through is lighter. Light afflictions and momentary, because they will end. This stuff will be over for you, which is but for a moment is working for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Do you believe that? See, if you don't believe it, it doesn't do any good just to say it. You have to believe it. Again, you have to replace. So I'm not going to do extreme thoughts anymore, and I'm going to focus on what Jesus says. I'm not going to do extreme thoughts. I'm going to focus on what Jesus says. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, again, here's this thinking issue because the devil knows, now you know, he will control you if you don't control yourself. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, think on these things. It's not just a matter of excluding thoughts, it's also a matter of replacing them. So you're going to just push these thoughts out of your head, you're going to create a void. That void's going to be filled. So who fills it? You better. Or someone else will. Be careful, again, focusing on Jesus. So, so let me ask you some questions about as you're getting away from the extreme thoughts and focusing on what the fact that Jesus is going to turn these horrible experiences into something good. Here's some questions to ask yourself. How has this offense benefited you? We're trying to get to the bottom of it. We're trying to get to the bottom where I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> Was it that? We're trying to get to the bottom where we can forgive. Not, not just saying to Jesus, I forgive them, but also emotionally in every way I have forgiven. We're trying to get to the bottom of that. Or, or ask yourself the question, how has this offense benefited me? You've got to get that answer because Jesus is working on that. Jesus, you're faithful. Jesus, you're powerful. You're bigger than all these offenses, all these things. So, so there is good coming from this. What, what is that? Ask him that. Are you closer to God? Are you more appreciative of others? More appreciative of life? I told you the story in Gary Smalley's book. He takes us through as he counsels this woman who from her earliest memories was being molested by her father. How is it possible that there could be good things that come out of that, right? How could you say that to this girl? He did. And this is what she found, among other things. She found out, she realized in this process of counting the pearls in her life, that her experience with her dad made her very sensitive and compassionate toward abuse victims. In fact, in many cases, she could minister to them like no one else could. She found she had an amazing ministry because they finally found someone who understood their situation. And in most cases, not near as bad as her experience. She was an incredible minister. She was also very sensitive to people, to children who were being abused. She could spot it. She realized, this is a ministry God's given to me. These are pearls. These are blessings that I can be because of awfulness in my life. Wow, that's pearl counting. I'm going to give you five things to do in finding pearls. These are in the notes, by the way. They're in the notes. They're on our website. You can download them. They're there. You can pick them up with your phone. I'm going to go 
kind of fast here, but I'm going to give you time to write. I want you to be able to do that. Number one, number one, my most painful trials. This is a list that I want you to make. It's an exercise for you to do later. Number one, my most painful tri trials. These are sandstorms in your life, the most painful things you've been through. They blind us, they sting, they irritate, they anger us, these sandstorms. But these are the, this is the sand in your life that God's going to make pearls out of. F list these sandstorms in, in order of pain. Most painful to least. Make a list. Again, we're trying to get to the bottom of this. Anger, listen, an unresolved anger is like an addiction. It really is. May I say this to you? You're addicted to it if that's where you are. Because here's what I know. All right, here's, here's what I can say to you. Then if you're not addicted, then just stop it right now. Never think on it again. Ah, you can't because you're addicted to it. You, you, you've been living off of it. You've been, if you will, getting high off of it for a very long time because you're, you're holding on to it. You're living for it. It's killing you, just like any addiction will. we got to get to the bottom of this. It's not simple, but God will do this through you. Number one, my most painful trials. Number them in order of severity. Number two, my lifelong strengths. You might need someone to help you with this. It's okay. Husband, wife, mom, dad, friend, find someone. Make a list. What do you do well? People skills, hobbies, what do you bring to a relationship or to a situation that people recognize as beneficial? Write these things down. This is not, we're not glorying in you. We're glorying in what God has done in you. God is working. If there's anything good in me or in you, it's because of God, right? Not because we have anything going on for ourselves. I'm a sinner deserving of hell. God is working hell and all the nastiness out of me. God's doing that, so I'm looking for these strengths because that's something that God has done. And then the third thing, third thing, my support people. These are people who have come alongside you in your trials, in your tribulations, in the experiences that you've had, and I want you to recognize those people because God has brought them into your life because often that's the way God works. So when we pray for help, when we pray God, help me. What are we looking for? Typically, I'm looking for some kind of miracle. I don't know. Money to fall out of the sky, uh, a healing just to come out of the blue, a circumstance to just change, and sometimes that's what happens. Mostly, though, in my experience, in the biblical experience, this is what happens. God sends a person into our lives or people into our lives. And that person are those people because of who they are and because of what the giftedness God has given to them, they become God's ambassador to rescue me. I've seen it happen in churches. I've seen it happen in individual lives. I've seen it happen in circumstances. It examples in the scripture. So, so the children of Israel are in slavery in Egypt, right? Praying to God, rescue us. Deliver us. Who do they get? Or what happens to them? Moses, an 80-year-old man, no offense to the, anybody in that age, shows up. Where's our miracle? Well, the miracles were in him as he obeyed God. Just, he's just a dude. He's just a guy. He's an Israeli just like them. But their answer God's answer to their need was a uh, man, uh, Cornelius, praying to God, God, teach us, show us. He sends Peter, doesn't send an angel, doesn't send a message, doesn't send a banner behind a plane, none of that. Sends a person to them. That, that speaks to two things. First of all, look for these people because you're going through trials. God is sending you people. God is sending you people. This is his pattern. His pattern to the world that is lost and dying and going to hell is send who? Not angels. Us. We, you and me, are the God's answer to the world's need and what's happening to them. We are. People are. Imperfect, yes. 
Needing a lot of help themselves? Absolutely. But God is not sending anything besides us. He has no other program other than human instrumentality. It's the way he does things. So number one, you need to look to yourself and say, how can I be that kind of person for somebody? Number two, who are these somebodies in my life? This is going to help you. God is sending people to you. He has, and he will. And then the fourth thing. So my most painful trials, my lifelong strengths, my support people, and then the third thing, the pearls, here's where it comes down to it. I have gained from each of these sandstorms in my life. Starting with the worst. Start with the top one. List the personal strengths that you have gained. Again, what are we trying to do? Get to the bottom of all that it's done to you and root it out. Get it out. How did Joseph get to the place where it was all out of his life and he did, wasn't had a heart of vengeance to his brothers? How? He got to the place where he realized, God, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Holding on to those pearls, wasn't he? Had all kinds of power and all kinds of authority and all kinds of chances now that dad is dead. But he didn't do it because he had these pearls. God is more powerful than what you intended to do through your evil. Start counting the pearls. Are you more patient because of them? these sandstorms? More kind, more tender, more forgiving, more perceptive, more appreciative, more empathetic more simple in the way you do things, realizing that life can be so short and things can really happen, more responsible, more spiritually mature. And use that, can't you? Are you less jealous, less arrogant, less fearful? Listen, I've not been through some of the pain that you've been through, but I have been through a lot of pain, and I can tell you, I'm a better person for it. I wouldn't for a second go through it again if I had a choice. But I wouldn't for a second and for any amount of money give up what I've gained because of them. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You better be glad that the Lord allowed me to be raked over the coals before he let me come and preach to you. I, you wouldn't want me here. You wouldn't want me. You wouldn't want the kind of person that Bill's capable of being. You don't want that guy. I don't like him either. I'm so glad that he is behind me now as much as the grace of God has allowed it to be. Less jealous, less arrogant, less fearful, less materialistic, less judgmental because of these sandstorms in your life. Listen to how Paul counts the pearls of his personal experiences. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, notice he hasn't been conceited yet, <laughs> just to keep him from doing that, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. Now, if there was anybody that knew how to pray, the, as it's so-called, the prayer of faith, it was this guy. Three times Paul prays the prayer that other times have healed people, have delivered people, have incredible miracles. He's, he, if the guy knows how to, this is a guy that knows how to pray. Three times, he says, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, effectively, no. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected or perfect in weakness. And he goes on to say, here's the pearls, here's the pearls, listen. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Isn't that weird? The Christian life lived correctly is weird. It is. It's not the way the world handles things. It's not what they do. We're called to be a totally different direction, totally different way of doing things and thinking. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That is counting pearls. That's finding the good stuff. Yeah, it was evil. It was bad. It was awful. It was suffering. It was terrible. I would have changed it a hundred times, but you know what? I'm better for it. I'm better, and may God be glorified in my life. I'm going to lose it all anyway. I'm going to lose his ability anyway. Life's short. I want to glorify God with it. I want to glorify God. 
There was an amputee, you know, often amputees experience some sensation they call phantom limb pain. You lose an arm, you lose a leg. I don't know, you lose your head, hopefully not. <laughs> you phantom, I miss my head all the time. Yeah. Phantom limb pain, so, so, so they lose a leg, but they can still feel their toes. Wake up in the middle of the night trying to itch a toe that isn't there. I had a guy in my former church, was a deacon in there, lost his leg from basically about here down because of different issues. And he would have pain in his ankle that didn't exist. What do you do about that? I mean, are you going to take ibuprofen? You can't do nothing. I mean, there's nothing you can do. Phantom limb pain. Well, there's a story I read about a guy who was having a similar situation to the deacon in my church. And he, he had a circulation problem, and it was causing tremendous pain in his leg. And the doctor said, there's only one remedy for this, and that is amputation. He says, you, you need to do it sooner than later because it's only going to get worse. And, of course, who wants to le- lose their limb? He, he, he convinced himself for years, I'm going to learn to live with this. I'm just going to learn to endure. I'm going I'm to just deal with it. And the doctor says, it, it's just going to get worse. Sure enough, it did. He literally got to the place where he was just embittered toward his leg, like he hated his leg. He hated it so much that when he finally submitted to the amputation process, he told the doctor, he said, I only ask for one thing. When I wake up, I want to see that leg. He said, I'm going to tell it, you can't do this to me anymore. I got you. You're gone. Well, he got his wish. He woke up from anesthesia, got to see the leg. I mean, that's crazy, but that's what he did. But then the leg got the last laugh. He had the f- exact same pain that he had had for months when the leg was there. It, it cut it off here, but it was somewhere around his knee or shin where the problem was. It hurt. It, it phantom. It's just out there. It's in the air. What can you do? It was awful. It's the exact same thing that unforgiveness will do to you. Bitterness will harm you. It will. You will not be an exception to that. The Scriptures don't say what they say for no reason. Ephesians 4, we've seen this many times. In your anger, don't sin. Do not. Don't assign motive. Don't hold on. Don't turn into God. You're going to exact vengeance. Listen, these are bad. They will hurt you. Do not let the sun go down on your anger while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Because believe me, he will take it. He has, listen, a vested interest to keep you angry. He has a vested interest. That's why he's lying to you right now saying you've got a right to hold on. You've got a right to stick with it. You, you, you can't let go of this. There will be no side effects to the way you feel. Mm-hmm. He's a liar. He can't disinherit you from the Lord, but he can, listen, get a foothold in your life. He can take you captive, the Scripture says. He can devour you, the Scripture says. Don't let him. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. By God's grace, with his power, let's start this journey together. Forgiving. Forgiving doesn't mean we trust them. Doesn't mean we like them. Doesn't mean we reconcile necessarily, even though God, believe me, wants that. But we don't, it doesn't require anyone to do anything for me whatsoever or for you for us to forgive them. Jesus has already paid for that. He hung himself on a cross to forgive your sins and in so doing paid for you the reason to forgive everyone else who sins against you. Do that by his power. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you have indeed given us the power to forgive. You called us to be a supernatural community. Naturally, we hold grudges. Naturally, we get overwhelmed by circumstances. Naturally, we overreact. Naturally, we think extreme thoughts. Naturally, we don't trust what your word says. We trust what our experiences say. So, God, we don't need the natural here. We need the supernatural. We're asking you, God, to intervene in our lives to bring us to the place of forgiveness, to bring us to the place where not only do we just theologically, intellectually say, God, we forgive them, but we're emotionally 
spiritually, we are healed from that, able to see how you've taken these terrible things that people meant for evil, these terrible experiences that we've gone through, and you've turned them into good. Lord, you are bigger than whatever we've, we are going through today. You're bigger than what we've experienced. You're exper bigger than the trials that have swept us away completely. You're bigger, God. We are taking these sands, storms in our life and turning them into pearls. Help us to see these things, we ask. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And ask you please to stand with me. We're going to sing together a hymn of invitation, inviting you to respond. God's working in your life. Maybe it's a prayer you need to pray. Maybe it's a decision you need to make. I'll be standing here. I would love to pray with you, speak with you. However God's leading you, come as we sing. Let me get you to be seated. We've got a couple here to introduce to you, Robert and Becky Ballinger. Is my saying that right? Ballin. Yeah. How do you say it? Belanger. Belanger. Mm -hmm. Well, I just pronounced it wrong. That's good. Okay. <laughs> Belanger, <laughs> Becky, Becky, and Robert Belanger yeah. come to us today, requesting membership uh, in our church. Uh, both have been saved. Uh, Robert saved and baptized. Becky to be baptized. We're going to get up there, and we got several to dunk around here. We're going to get it done. They also have a uh, little son, right? Yes. And uh, part of our uh, nursery right now, but they just desire, feel like God's called them here, and this is the church they want to be part of, already plugged into our Sunday schools, and so come forward to say they want to join. We're, we want to welcome you all. We're so glad uh, that you've decided to pick us. We're, um, we need you here. So we know that because this is God send us. Whoever God sends us is the people that we need, and we're, we need those gifts and talents. And so we know God's sending us blessings every time he sends us people. So we praise God for them. A uh, couple of announcements, and y'all just hang out right here. Y'all are good right there. So just stand up here and look pretty because I need help. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of announcements. This coming Sunday is going to be a special Sunday, regular services on Sunday. We are going to have Lord's Supper. We were supposed to have it today, but um, we had a bathroom problem. I don't know if y'all know about that or not. Uh, hope you came without drinking water after midnight because that's a bathroom's way down there, way over there. Hopefully next Sunday, by God's grace, we'll have that fixed. We're going to be having Lord's Supper. We're also going to be having Sunday afternoon, evening. We're going to be having a special concert slash testimony question answering time from two Jewish women. One of them is an Israeli. And uh, her name is Lori Kate uh, Lowenhar. And she's been resident now of Israel for 20, 22 years. Uh, born and raised in Indiana, both these girls. Raised as Christians, both Jewish background. Uh, Lori has immigrated to Israel a long time ago. She has children that are in, in, in Israeli army there. 
Uh, she's going to bring, uh, first of all, speak, singing, singing in Hebrew and English. It's going to be a great time. Uh, they just seem to be super gifted ladies. But also testimony, question and answer. What's life really like in Israel? What's it like to have children uh, in harm's way in current conflict? You know, of course, happening there. That's going to be this coming Sunday at 5 o'clock. So tonight, 5 o'clock, we're having our, uh, our uh, business meeting. Next Sunday at 5 o'clock, we're going to be having this great concert. So two 5 o'clocks to remember. Also, the 2nd of May is our uh, nationwide prayer, our national day of prayer. We're going to be having a special focus here in this auditorium all day on that Thursday from 9 o'clock till 5 o'clock. There are sign-up sheets in our Sunday school classes. There may be some in the hall. I'm not aware of it, if there is, but we need them. We want you to come and pray. Our nation needs prayer. Would you agree? And who, who's supposed to do that? So, so God's sending help to our nation. Who are they? That's right. Don't look at me. The angels aren't coming down from heaven. We're the ones. God sends people. You're the people. I'm the people. So let's come together and pray. This, this coming, not this coming Thursday, but Thursday the 2nd of, of May. So I want to put that on your calendar. Sign up for a time. Come and pray throughout the day. Uh, come early, come late if you're working. Uh, but the doors are going to be open for that, and so we want to be make sure we do do that our, the best that we possibly can, doing our job uh, for the sake of our nation. So, anything else we're Mr. missing? Warm, thank you to the Handbell Choir. You did a Amen. phenomenal job today. Thank you, ladies, thank so you much. Very much. Pat. Love, absolutely love the giftedness and the opportunity to to minister to us. Thank you so much, ladies, for that. So, all right, good to go. We are. I just all need right, a chord. Sing our ways out of here. Here we go, ready? Somebody this week, I believe, I believe. 